Hello everyone and welcome to the last lecture in our geriatric healthcare lecture series for the spring 2016 um, term. My name is Barbara Cochran. I'm the director of the Deterney Center for Healthy Aging here in the School of Nursing. I'm also associate director of the Northwest Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Center which sponsors this lecture series. Um, the lecture series this term has been focused on Alzheimer's disease and related dementias and today we're really happy to have kind of a wrap-up um, that Dr. Stephen Thelke is going to offer to us. But first I want to remind you that you can get continuing education credits for this lecture series and you should talk with your site coordinators about that. Uh, next I'd like to remind you if you haven't filled out a profile form um, before please do so. And then thirdly, we will be starting up our um, geriatric healthcare lecture series again next winter term. That is going to be focused on more general topics, um, including some updates. And then spring term again is going to have a focus on Alzheimer's disease and related dementia again. Some new topics potentially as well as um, updates from some previous lectures. We'll be in a different room, but hopefully you won't notice um, too much um, of a change. So I'd like to introduce, you've met him several times before, uh, Dr. Stephen Thelke. He's a geriatric psycho psychiatrist and health services researcher at the University of Washington and the Puget Sound VA Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center, also known as the GREC. He's the GREC Associate Director for Education and Evaluation, but he also conducts research about dementia medications, depression and pain in older adults, and the use of monitoring technologies in healthcare. He's an incredibly popular um, lecturer for this series, and also I'm going to put a plug in for um, the Elder Friendly Futures series that's going to be held at September 15th and 16th here at um, in Seattle at Linwood Convention Center. Um, we have two days of um, sessions and presentations focused on um, community-based services as well as um, services for older adults in care settings and other cutting edge uh, phenomenon in um, gerontology and uh, you can look us up at uh, www.elderfriendlyfutures.org uh, to find out more about the conference and now I'd like to introduce Stephen Thelke who's going to for us miraculously put it all together challenges in dementia. Welcome. Hey well thanks Barb. And I, I'd agree with Barb about that conference. It really is a, a fantastic uh, opportunity to learn about a lot of uh, really important topics uh, in uh, elder care. And it's a nice time of year if you want to visit from out of town. So um, I think Barb gave you that link. So um, it's uh, my job to uh, sum up the dementia series today. And um, as, as you probably would guess I'm faced by an, an obvious uh, challenge, which is that you've had a series of speakers who are each experts in their own field who have talked to you for an hour and a half each and explained uh, where they're coming from and what their, their key points are. And I have no chance of uh, you know, being able to explain things as clearly as they did in their respective areas. And also, uh, we didn't necessarily plan this so that everything would fit together. We picked the topics that we assumed would be most interesting to um, folks, uh, but it's it's not like there was a secret uh, sub-theme or subtext that we were going to re reveal on the last day. So it's probably a, a little bit of a misnomer to say I'm going to put it all together. Um, instead, I, I'd like to think that what, what I, we can do today is give you a chance to think about what um, was covered during this whole series and to think about your role in dementia care and where you'd like to, to go with this and how you'd like to approach people with dementia. And uh, the better analogy would be to you know step back a little bit and to see things from a distance and to see what, what connections and what themes hold together between the talks. Um, so the, the main theme um, that I, I think really stands out um, is that dementia is a challenge. It's, it's not an easy condition uh, to deal with. Uh, there's no textbook or cookie cutter or cookbook approach that you can use for dealing with dementia. 
And anybody who works in the, the field appreciates that pretty fast. So if you're one of those people who likes to have a checklist and you, you get everything done and you get everything uh, you know, completed and taken care of, dementia is not the field for you uh, because it, it really requires a lot of cognitive flexibility and it requires uh, thinking very broadly about the individual and their world. So the, the theme that I wanted to explore today was uh, why dementia is difficult. Why is, is dementia um, such a challenge to individuals and to healthcare and to society? And I hope to come at that from a, a variety of angles. So the way I, I approached this was I, I went through all the talks, um, learned, learned a lot from, from looking at them again, and picked out a couple slides from every talk and then tried to group them around these four main themes. I was going to go through every single talk and just fast forward through all of them, <laughs> kind of a uh, subliminal advertising effect, but figured that probably wasn't the best approach. So I'm just going to touch on the, the highlights from each talk and, and uh, apologize to the, the speakers if I miss some of their more important points, um, but, but figure that you have the opportunity to see those. And then as a reminder, they are all available online if you'd like to look at them later or to download the slides. So the, the, the themes um, that I want to go into are, first of all, that uh, dementia is not just a disease. Um, and, and if you think about it just as a disease or a single abnormality in the brain, you'll be mis misguided uh, both in terms of what you are trying to do and also in uh, how you uh, treat people with dementia and their families. Uh, secondly, it's, it's much more than the individual. We'll explore that in some detail, especially the effects on the caregiver. Um, the, the third point um, is that you know, one case of dementia is not like any other case, and you really need to remember the individual's experience and how it can manifest differently. And then finally, uh, more, more broadly, dementia kind of inherently or necessarily involves ethical challenges. And I'll ex explain that in a variety of ways. And uh, one, one of the talks definitely was about ethical challenges, but I'm going to try to show how it really is a theme in pretty much anything you do in dementia. Because what you're talking about is someone who no longer has the capacities that they used to. And, and what does that mean when you're working with them or telling them that they can't do things um, or that, that they're un unable to make their own decisions? So the, the, the first uh, theme is about you know, what is dementia? If somebody asked you what dementia was, you'd say, well, it's a, it's a disease, obviously. It's like high blood pressure or uh, diabetes or arthritis. Um, and you'd be, you'd be right. I mean, technically, it, it is a disease. Um, but when you think about how it, how it works and what effects it has, you realize that it's far more than that. What I'm going to do first is give you a very big overview of our series and what the, the whole NWGEC um, series has been for the since since its outset in terms of all the, the lectures that are available. So this is just a, a reminder of um, what what lectures you saw here. All the updated ones are the um, lectures that are, are relatively recent, and they all all relate uh, to dementia in in one form or another. Um, and you'll notice that some of the, the lectures that were not done this year. Um, include things like bipolar disorder, uh, delirium, uh, depression, sleep and uh, dementia, uh, palliative care and hospice, which is kind of a tip-off. You know, th these aren't really directly within the domain of dementia, but they're related enough that, that they can be part of the series. And what I'm going to suggest is that basically dementia includes any kind of disease. And when you think about dementia, you have to appreciate how it affects and any aspect of healthcare and the individual as a whole. So this, this is how the, the whole series, not just the dementia series, is broken down uh, on the website. If you, if you haven't had a chance to look at this, I was just telling Barb what a, what a nice and nicely organized uh, compendium it is. It really is a, a very rich uh, resource. And if you're interested in one of these topics, you just click on it and you see all the lectures that are available. Um, so here's a, here's a list of all the topics that have been covered in the NWGEC from the beginning. And you can, you can look over these yourself. A lot of them have to do specifically with dementia. A lot of them seem like they don't have hardly anything to do with dementia, like coronary artery disease. Um, or uh, falls are on there, um, intellectual or developmental disabilities, 
uh, hypertension, nutrition. Um, here's the, the whole list just, just for your uh, reference. What I'm going to argue is that, in fact, you can't think about any one of these conditions, either pain management, uh, physical activity, pneumonia, the pulse, uh, per prevention, press pressure ulcers, rheumatology, without being able to see that it has a different manifestation if it's in the setting of dementia. That is, alcohol problems are an entity in and of themselves. But when you, when you add on dementia, dementia is a part of it, suddenly it has a very different meaning. And the way you would think about the disease, the way you would approach working up the disease and figuring out what to do with it would be entirely different if you had someone who has no signs of dementia compared to somebody who does have dementia. Just to, to take alcohol problems, for instance. If somebody comes in um, and they've got a history of alcohol, heavy alcohol use, and they're showing early signs of cognitive impairment that are suggestive of dementia, you have to think of a whole list of other things that you wouldn't consider if you're just dealing with somebody who's cognitively intact and having alcohol problems. We had a case just like, like this last week in clinic where um, the wife of the patient wanted us to provide a letter saying that um, her husband was uh, not able to make decisions for himself and therefore she wanted to um, have control of the bank accounts and other, other uh, aspects of their life. Um, because he was both drinking so heavily and having cognitive problems. He'd been drinking heavily for years and years. It had never become a problem until uh, dementia appeared, in which case the alcohol became a very different sort of problem, and it, it had different effects on their lives and on, on his judgment. Even something like anemia. Uh, the decision about what to do with anemia uh, is based on you know, what you expect the outcome to be, and how, how likely that will result in an improvement. If you've got someone with advanced dementia, do you really, really want to be giving them transfusions on a regular basis or aggressive medical treatments? Uh, so having dementia as part of the mix changes basically every one of the geriatric syndromes that you're going to encounter. And that's part of why it's so difficult, because it's not just like a disease that exists on its own. Uh, in fact, when you have the combination of disease with another condition, it changes the manifestation and the, the meaning and how you deal with the other condition. So I, I think anybody who uh, works in geriatrics comes to appreciate this pretty quickly. Um, and it's, it's certainly not a surprise. But it took me quite a while to really figure out that I, I was unable in any of my clinical work to carve out dementia and just to put it there on the problem list and say, oh, you've got high blood pressure um, and uh, diabetes and COPD and dementia, and we're just going to deal with these all the same. That when dementia is there, it, it colors or changes all the other conditions. So I think that this, this has, has come out in the series. In particular, the, the one lecture that dealt with this directly was Dr. Snowden's lecture on uh, dementia and multimorbidity, and where he, he discussed the um, variety of chronic conditions and geriatric syndromes, which are, are nicely listed here. These are the, the bread and butter of geriatrics, um, both the, the conditions themselves and the, the syndromes that go along with them. And to follow up on the, the point that we just discussed, each of these would be a different manifestation when it was in the setting of dementia. And the example that, that he worked on uh, most directly was in the case of uh, depression. And you know, so what if somebody has depression and dementia? Does that really matter? And in fact, it matters a huge amount uh, for you to understand what the uh, interplay is uh, between uh, depression and dementia and to realize that the, the way someone experiences and expresses uh, their, their mood symptoms and the way, the course that the symptoms take and uh, more importantly for us, the approach that one takes is different in the setting of dementia than without dementia. And that has been investigated in some detail and that's the basis for the um, interventions that Dr. Snowden discussed. The other 
way that, that this appears is not just about the overlap of diseases, but in fact the effect of dementia on quality of life. Um, so this was the, the quality of, of life lecture, and this is a, a nice summary in that of how uh, dementia really impacts people's sense of well-being, their satisfaction with life, and their self-esteem. I, th I think you can appreciate that this kind of slide would be a, a little bit of a stretch if you're talking about hypertension. You know, maybe hypertension in influences your, your satisfaction with life, but not in these core ways that dementia does. So, as insofar as it's a medical disease, it has very broad implications for people's overall life. Even the, the lecture on Parkinson's dementia, which is a, a more focused and, and clinical um, evaluation, points out that in, in Parkinson's dementia, you've also, in, in addition to the pure neurologic symptoms, there's also depression, anxiety, uh, problems with sexual dysfunction, bladder urgency. So this is an, another case where even in a very narrow form of dementia, Parkinson's disease, you get a, a bleeding of effects or a, a generalization so that the dementia is much more than just the disease itself. So when, when, you, when you really stop to think about what the effects of dementia are on, on the individual, and especially their, their health care, um, you, you appreciate that dementia would impact how you would diagnose a condition. Because a lot of the, the diagnosis you make is based on self-report. If somebody can't tell you what their symptoms are, you're unlikely to diagnose them with a condition. And that's part of the logic that Dr. Snowden was uh, exploring, that if somebody doesn't come out and tell you, oh yeah, my mood's bad, um, even though it is, uh, you won't be likely to find someone who's got depression in the setting of dementia. In terms of preventing uh, any other diseases, the, the question is how, how much is it worth it? What are your goals of care? Um, most of our prevention efforts are based around giving people advice, you know, like, hey, why don't you get out and exercise or eat, eat better or uh, you know, take, take this medication to prevent bad outcomes. And your ability to do that if somebody has dementia is greatly diminished. You can't assume that they're going to be responsible. Obviously, the ability to track symptoms over time is worse if you're depending on people to tell you um, what's going on. The whole, oh, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say, we can adjust the camera. Am I, is it too low or down? too high? Yeah, well, you're. Oh, OK. You're All right, how about if I sit down? Sense. That's kind of fun. I'll, <laughs> it's not too, too close. Thanks for checking on that, Barb. Um, so the, the patient ex experience of the disease is also going to be uh, different and what, what the disease means to them. So uh, it's trying to explain what is you know, hypertension or uh, diabetes, you know, if somebody doesn't have cognitive impairments or difficulties, they will uh, conceptualize that and uh, incorporate it into their lives. But if somebody has a cognitive impairment, it can have a very different meaning. The interactions with healthcare uh, clearly uh, change uh, because you can't just have someone in your office, ask them how they're doing, uh, give them a treatment, and to send them on their way. That you have a, when dementia comes to a certain degree or, or uh, se severity, you need to rely on someone else's report. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that uh, treatment adherence, especially medications, is greatly diminished in uh, people who have early dementia who don't have somebody else giving them their treatments. The goals of treating any condition are changed if you assume that someone has another terminal condition like dementia. And then the risk-benefit analysis that you use when you're trying to pick a, a treatment is changed. So th this, there's, there's other ways, too. I'm, I'm sure you, you can uh, think of them yourself. Um, but basically, the, the point is, whenever um, dementia is present, uh, you can't approach a medical condition head on or without considering what it really means to someone. You have to think about the bigger picture. All right, so that, that's the end of uh, the, the background on why dementia is not just a disease. The other theme that is prominent um, in any, any kind of work or discussion of dementia or clinical care for dementia is the fact that you've got another player. Um, and caregiving really is the biggest challenge in dementia care. Uh, I, I say this without reservations. Um, 
that the, the toughest thing about dementia is not really the experience of the disease itself. Instead, it's the effects that the disease has on the individual's role functioning and um, their uh, relationships in life and the effects that it has on the people who provide the, the care. Uh, so for the most part, um, as a very broad generalization, people who have dementia are uh, pretty well taken care of. Uh, their course won't be that much different depending on what treatments you use or um, other medical decisions. But the uh, caregiver's life will be enormously impacted based on the type of supports that they have. And the, the core message in this that I'm sure you've heard before is that the, the, the key is really to care for the caregiver. And our system doesn't do a very good job of caring for the caregiver. And uh, hopefully, it's changing to be able to address that better in the future. But as the, the lecture on, on caregiving pointed out, um, caregiving is just a ton of work. It's, uh, it's not something you can do with a small amount of time or uh, without emotional investment. It's, it's disruptive to, to life in many ways, can have negative consequences on mental health. It basically takes away the time that you would have spent on yourself. So the question I ask of caregivers uh, is, do you get time for yourself? And pretty much uniformly, their answer is no, I, I don't. You know, I'll, pretty much I'll, every, every waking minute is spent in caregiving. And you can just imagine what, what that would mean for someone's uh, quality of life as, as well as for their ability to keep their life organized. So obviously, the caregiving is a big deal. And the reminder that, that uh, we are caregivers also and that there is an emotional aspect um, that, that must be acknowledged from working in the, the field of uh, dementia. Uh, that it, it's not like you can just show up and assume you're going to fix things. Uh, maybe, maybe there are, are jobs in uh, you know, certain fields where you go to work, you feel like you fix something, you cure something, and then you go home and you, you, you feel good. And in uh, dementia, there's a lot of days where um, you're faced with other people's challenges and you have to um, figure out how to, how to deal with them and to, to make the most of challenging situations. Um, so but burnout is an issue. I like this uh, reminder here that our, our job is to serve and not to fix. And I'll come back to this at the end, that when you think about what your, your role is, uh, your chances of just giving somebody a bit of good advice and having them act on it and then their problems go away is, is very little. Um, but that, that in, in fact, our role in being present, in knowing um, how, uh, how dementia works, and being emotionally available to uh, patients really is a, an important, and as a, some, some, the, the slide puts it here, an, an amazing job. So it's, it's not all, all uh, downside or uh, negativity that, that really, w within the, the struggle, there is a lot of payoff. So this is a, a very, very nice summary from the, the caregiving talk about how providers can, can deal with this. So you need to under, understand the, the purposes of uh, evaluating caregivers, uh, to en engage with caregivers, even when not asking for help. And that's a, a reminder that when you, whenever you deal with the caregiver, you want to ask how they're doing. Don't just deal with the patient. So that, that question like, do you get time for yourself? How are you feeling? Uh, really is, is central. Listening and reflecting uh, is, is key, and then acknowledging that there are real emotions. The normalizing part of it um, is important, and I'm going to come, come to that in just a minute. But uh, you know that over time, as more technologies have developed, this has been a great opportunity for people to connect with others who are doing, uh, who are in the, the same boat, and to appreciate that, that it's a huge amount of work and a, a very um, large investment that they're making. And, the caregiver support groups really have been effective. There are certain um, of the situations uh, that are particularly difficult for caregivers uh, and for uh, providers. Uh, some of them are listed here. And these are, are largely around uh, end of life issues or when someone seems to be in distress and it's unclear what you're, you're trying to accomplish. And I think that the caregiver is faced with situations like this on a day-to-day -day basis. You, know, you put all the time and effort in, and then at some point you ask, you know, what am I, what am I really doing? Who, who's, whose wishes am I I'm satisfying here? 
and well, what's the uh, the purpose. So the, the more clarity there is around what you're trying to accomplish, the easier the work is. The um, nor normalizing part, I, this, this book I'll recommend it again. It's a very uh, straightforward, uh, good read. Uh, the, somebody recently told me that's on CD and they listened to it uh, as they were driving. Uh, pe people really resonate with the phrase 36 hour day. So if you just have that handy when you're talking to a caregiver and you say it sounds like you're working the 36 hour day, a lot of times they, they really understand what you're talking about. And then when you're talking to them, um, it's just important not to make assumptions about what part might be easy or what might part might be hard. There's a lot of people who talk about the um, meaning and value they get out of caregiving, that it's part of their life role, they signed up for it, and they're, they're glad to do it, and they wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, there's other people who clearly are very stressed out and uh, don't handle it very well. So it's, it's important to, uh, to know where the caregiver's coming from and to focus on everyone's well-being. And then finally, a, a plug for the, all the community services that are available that generally do a much better job of dealing with these core issues than does medical care. All right, so I'm going to turn now to the, um, the individual nature of dementia. So if you look at you know, other, other conditions, say hypertension or uh, diabetes, there may be some variations, but for the most part, they're the same kind of disease process and they have roughly the same effects on people. However, d dementia really is extremely heterogeneous. Um, I, I've been working in this field for uh, over a decade and my ability to predict what happens in any case of dementia is just really bad. I have no idea if somebody is going to um, you know, keep the personality characteristics they used to have, if they've been you know, friendly, warm, and funny their whole life, if they're going to stay like that through the course of dementia, or if they're going to change into something else. Um, it's very hard to predict what domains are going to deteriorate, if it's language or executive functioning or uh, memory. So it's a, a real challenge because in the, the disease, parts of the brain are deterior, deteriorating and there's no reason based on earlier life experience or even any other disease or person level characteristics to make assumptions about which ones are going to deteriorate. Eventually you, you get a, a rate of change and you can assume that the rate of change is going to be about the same in the future as the past, but that doesn't uh, take you all that far in terms of prognosis. So the, the saying that the Alzheimer's Association has that I, I really like and, and use a, a lot is that when you've seen one case of Alzheimer's, you've seen one case of Alzheimer's. That it's, it's not like you can collapse a dementia patient into a um, type and say, oh, you know, this is what's going to happen to you and uh, uh, pretty soon you're just going to be like every other case of, of dementia. That it really is an individual um, disease. And I think that the way this came out nicely in the lecture series was in the, the talk about differential diagnosis, uh, where Dr. Trichu pointed out that a lot of the same complaints that you hear uh, related to people's mood or energy or, or memory, in fact, could be from a variety of causes, including that last one, which is, uh, you know, there, there's a change in medical treatment and the patient doesn't do it. What does that mean? Potentially, it could be a manifestation of dementia. So the, the way she broke it down was uh, dementia, delirium, and depression all involve common features, uh, but each has sep uh, different hallmarks. And the, the key here is that there's no absolute dividing line, that everyone's experience of cognitive problems is going to be a little bit different, as is their experience of mood problems. And our role is to try to sort out um, from the individual experience, whether you're talking about a general phenomenon. The um, recommendations about how to deal with the psychosocial distress in dementia similarly focus on the, the individual as a, a person and seeing them not just as a broken brain, but rather uh, understanding that dementia is affecting various parts of their life, that you need to re remember people's mood, uh, things they like to do, making sure that they have meaningful activities and activity, um, other, other types of physical activities um, that, that will, will keep them engaged in life. Um, 
basically what happens in, in my experience is if you start treating a dementia patient just like a cookie cutter dementia patient, they will lose interest because the, the treatments or supports are not tailored to them and eventually you will run into problems. So the, the, the best way that you can deal with the, the person is to really individualize what you're offering to them. So that's a, that's a, a, a quick rundown on why uh, dementia is not just a, a disease, uh, how it affects more than just the individual, and um, how every case of dementia is different. And I want to spend the last bit of time, and hope, hopefully be, be done pr pretty early today, talking about the ethical challenges that are inherent in dementia. So I'm going to approach this from a, a variety of uh, different per perspectives. Some of this stuff has is, is not been in the, the talks before, but I, th I think it relates. So one of the challenges that you, you, you may be faced with is whether to tell people you think they've got early dementia. So you work them up. It looks like they uh, have the risk factors. They may be showing some cognitive changes. And you're faced with a variety of options for what you could tell someone. So either you could say, you know, I have to tell the truth. I see there's evidence here. I need to tell them exactly what's going on. Or, well, if I was in their situation, I'd want to know. Or people I know, people I care about would want to know if they were getting dementia. Or a reasonable person would be. Or you could take a pragmatic approach and say, well, you know, it's useful to have this information to plan for the future. As you get down the list, you can see that the, the reasoning changes. And you could also argue with just as much fact and logic that knowing about having dementia doesn't really help the individual. I mean, yes, they're, they're on a downward slope, and you think so. But is it, is it really going to help them lead their life better? Um, you could reason that people who have found out they have dementia have, have regretted it, that it hasn't, hasn't been uh, useful. You could also say, well, you know, maybe I, I'm wrong on this, and what's the consequence of telling someone who doesn't have dementia, yes, you have dementia, you've got seven to nine years to live, and it's going to be a huge burden on your family. So the thought of having someone live with that when you're not 100% certain would discourage you from saying anything, as might the, the general uh, thought that if, well, you're being ignorant of it isn't going to hurt you. So. As you go down the list, you, you can see there's a reason for any one of these approaches to early diagnosis, and none of them is absolutely right. And there's really no scientific or factual basis for picking any one of these. It's based on what your sense of the desired objective is. So there, there is no right answer, clearly. But I do want to um, give a little bit of data when the, the New York Times, from a from a popular press perspective rather than from a scientific perspective, they went out and interviewed a bunch of people who had an early diagnosis of dementia. And kind of the common theme up from them was, I wish I didn't know. So when they thought about what it meant for their families and how it was going to affect their lives, the process of knowing that you, you've got a cognitive impairment and it's going to get worse and it's going to have negative effects, that you'd, you'd sleep better at night just assuming you were having um, some some subtle difficulties. So all of all of these perspectives bring to the surface the ethical challenge, which is you know even for a fundamental question like should I tell someone they have a diagnosis, which would seem pretty straightforward. Um, you know if, if you know somebody's got diabetes and their blood sugar is really high, well it seems like an ethical imperative to tell them yes you have diabetes and you can treat it. But when it comes to dementia, it's even challenging whether you would want, you know, in all circumstances, to tell the individual. Uh, this this came out too in the uh, lecture on uh, Parkinson's disease, where Dr. Sami pointed out that you know there's uh, different opinions about when you should start treatment. So some people say you should start at the as soon as you're diagnosed, like you got the disease, you need the treatment. Other people say you should wait until there's functional impairments. And the goal here is to say. You know, what are you accomplishing? What's the, the good? Is the good to treat the disease or is the good to help the symptom? And there's, there's once again, no straightforward answer. I, my, my experience with uh, driving is that it clearly is an ethical dilemma. It's a, a, a challenge. Uh, driving is a privilege or a, a right. Most, most people see it as a, 
a right in our society, and it's very it's tied to your identity and your independence. And what does it mean to tell someone they cannot drive? Basically, you're taking away one of their civil liberties. So the the um, lecture about driving nicely um, articulated some of the ways that you can approach this, that you don't just come out and say, you can't drive, um, that, that it's important to validate what the difficulty is they're having, describe it as a privilege, and then to frame it softly to the individual um, that you know, we need to know more and it, it may be important for you to, to drive less. Um, the, the phrase that the people have found very useful that I, I think came out in the talk was retirement from driving. That it's it's not quitting driving or having your license taken away or your car taken away, that you're you're retiring from driving, which makes it into more of a success story uh, that someone drove their whole life, they did a good job of it, and now they can retire. A, a recent finding came out uh, that complicates this, and I just wanted to, to uh, point this out because it's such a, a, a recent publication. I don't think it was in the talk. And this, this one really made me reconsider what our approach is to driving. So the, these uh, researchers looked at the effects of driving on various health outcomes and found that when people stopped driving, uh, they reported numerous other health problems, in particular depression, like the risk of depression about doubled after people stopped driving. And I think that makes sense in our modern world, uh, that if, if you can't get out, if you're homebound, uh, your chances of being uh, emotionally upset are going to be higher, um, although it's hard to say maybe they stopped driving because of, of they were having mood problems. But uh, it's, it's definitely not just like your goal is to protect the public by stopping people who are unsafe from driving, that you need to balance the effects of stopping driving with the, um, the, the risks of the, the person being on the road. So very, very clearly it's a moral challenge that you're dealing with and not a scientific one. Uh, Dr. Vig's talk about uh, ethical challenges was a, a I, I've, I've seen her, her talk on this in a number of uh, settings and every time I, I learn a, a lot and it's a great reminder about uh, how difficult uh, geriatric care is because we're basically making determinations about uh, people's capacities and if we say they don't have a capacity we're essentially depriving them of one of the civil liberties that's you know written into uh, the, the uh, you know, Bill of Rights, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you're, you're infringing on someone's liberty if you're telling them they have to live in a certain place or they have to receive or not receive a certain treatment. Um, so ca capacity is an, an ethical d dilemma from, from the outset, and geriatric medicine, and especially dementia, raises a lot of issues. So if somebody has a condition and they say you can't treat it and you think that the reason they're saying that is they don't understand it, uh, you're uh, in, a, in a difficult bind and you need to make a determination that balances out whatever you consider the good to be with whatever the patient is considering the good to be and their, their right for aut autonomy. And the biggest place that um, comes to light is around uh, end of life and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so. Dr. Vig's point that I think is very, very important to remember, and it has this beautiful passage from the Washington law, and I imagine that other states have laws that um, specify something like this, that just because you have dementia or some other psychiatric condition doesn't mean you don't have capacity to make your decisions. Uh, and I'm, I'm always surprised when I see people in clinic and it comes up and I'm trying to assess the decision-making process in people with dementia, how good a lot of their decisions are. You know, they may not be able to articulate every reason for it, but they um, are able to make moral judgments and to um, describe what their values and preferences are, and then to decide on a course of treatment that fits with those values and preferences. So definitely having the, the diagnosis doesn't mean that someone else has to make decisions for you. And I, I, I really like this quotation that age, eccentricity, poverty, or medical diagnosis alone shall not be sufficient to justify a finding of incapacity. That is, your, your starting position should be that people can make their own decisions 
and you shouldn't be prejudiced about that based on someone's uh, you know, age or clinical status or life circumstances. So that, that's always an, an empowering uh, reflection. And then the, the lecture that uh, Dr. Stewart did about um, end-of-life care covered a lot of material um, and he uh, brought home some very important points about how our system fails to deal properly with end-of-life care. So this is kind of the, uh, the bad and the ugly part of end-of-life care that, that he elicits here, that people want to die at home, but most people die in a facility. Most people want to be able to discuss their end-of-life issues, but almost nobody gets the chance. People want to put things in writing, but only a quarter of them do. And basically, people say they don't want to be a burden on their families, but they never get an opportunity to express that. So he, he proposed a, a very workable system for how to um, approach end-of-life care differently. Uh, but this, this is fundamentally an ethical challenge, and especially one in dementia. So the, the challenge with uh, dementia is obviously that people's ability to articulate these kind of issues, like what the, the first part of, of each of these statements, um, is going to be compromised the further you get into dementia. Uh, so at, at some point that the challenge is that uh, having a sound mind is no longer something you can take for granted. Uh, and therefore, the earlier you can carry out this process, the better. So if, if somebody's got dementia and you have to make end-of-life decisions, it's compounded. It's orders of magnitude more difficult for the, the, the people involved because they're trying to decide for someone else. And I, Without going into the literature too much, that the general finding is that people are more conservative about other people's health care than about their own. So if you ask someone, you know, how, what kind of treatment would you like, they'd say, well, I, I only want comfort care. I don't want unnecessarily you know, life-sustaining interventions. But when they're asked to make judgments about, say, their spouse or their parent or another loved one, they'll say, oh, I think they would want you know, more life-sustaining interventions. So all of, all of this is to say that when it comes to these really core ethical challenges, we need to have a better system of dealing with them on the early side rather than waiting until late in the, the uh, process of dementia. So to, to, to finish up here, um, and I, I hope we have time for questions. I, I apologize if I, I can't answer the specific questions from the other, other speakers, but I'd sure be happy to um, talk, talk in general. Or we could have a, a discussion, um, if, if possible, about these topics. What I, I'd, I'd like you to reflect on is, you know, what you you consider your role to be when you're dealing with people with dementia. Um, can can you fix their problem? Very unlikely. It's an un, untreatable disease. Can you make decisions for them or, or tell them what to do? Um, ex, explain how how things are. Give them advice. Um, you know, these these are. The typical kind of healthcare provider roles, um, when they're framed like this, you can see that they don't sound that good. You know, it's kind of like, do you really go to see someone so they can tell you what to do, um, or is your role more to to listen, to to be present, understand where someone's coming from, uh, really to to be present emotionally, um, or to to help people connect with other resources or with other people. And I want to end um, at the, the a final theme. Um, the, the more I work in uh, psychiatry and in uh, geriatric psychiatry and in healthcare in general, the more I, I feel my role is not to give people advice or to provide them treatments. It's to give them permission to do things they may not have considered before. So I'd like to think when they come, after they, they come into our clinic and spend some time talking about what their condition is and where, where they're at and how they're dealing with it, that they will think that there are other other ways that they can deal with their own um, difficulties. And the, the role of the healthcare system can be there to facilitate that and to um, let them know that it's OK, um, especially around caregiving issues, where if the, the caregiver has refused to get additional help, we give them permission to get some help. Or 
especially around children. The, the kids live nearby, but they have busy lives, and the uh, spouse of the person with dementia says, I just can't call my kids because they're so busy with their own lives. And by talking to them, we realize that, that they, they have the permission to call in the family for help when needed. And when that happens, suddenly everything seems to work better. So in, in, d dementia doesn't have a cure. It's, um, it's, it's not something that we are going to make disappear. Uh, but I believe that by approaching it from a truly human perspective and re remembering the individual and rather rather than the disease that, that we will be able to make the lives of people who have uh, dementia better um, on, on a lot of fronts, um, not only the people with dementia, but, but the people around them. So why don't I stop there and we'll um, take any questions. Um, it looks like I, I only saw the beginning of that. Is there a, a way, Barb, that okay, I... I'll read it to you. Okay. I was just sending... Someone right. had asked how they see the past lecture, so I was sending them the... Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so if you want to see the, the past lectures, Barb sent the, the link out. Yeah. And it's uh, very convenient. So um, this was... I was visiting with one of my co-workers earlier this afternoon, and one of the things she pointed out is that there's a difference between people who live in a nursing home and those who choose to live in assisted living homes. Her main concern, if I remember correctly, is that people who live in assisted living facilities could live at home, but have chosen to live in an assisted living situation. As such, their um, emotional needs are different. I'm wondering as to whether or not you or someone associated with the UW um, could address this in a future webinar. Hey, that's a that's a, a really fantastic topic. You know, we're we're talking about what to, to put next year um, in our series, and that would be something very interesting to um, to discuss. The we don't know all that much about transitions in, in living. Um, we've we've done some work uh, researching what the effect is of moving to a retirement community, and published a, a paper um, last year about the health effects. So we were operating under the assumption that when people move from living independently to living in a ret retirement type facility that they might have a decline in their physical or mental health. Um, the other alternative would be that when you live in a new environment, suddenly you're, you're surrounded by people who probably have more health needs than in the community. And therefore, in social comparison, you, you relatively might feel better than you had before. Because instead of being surrounded by all the healthy people in the world, suddenly you're surrounded by people who have similar conditions to what you do. And what we found is that basically there was no effect on people's physical or mental health when they moved into a retirement facility. But that doesn't, that doesn't address the um, core issue that, that you brought up, which is how do different living arrangements impact people's well-being. Barb and I were just talking about how this really can have very different meaning cross-culturally. Um, and in China, they have even totally different vocabulary for describing those living situations. So that's a, a fantastic suggestion. And uh, next year, we'll have to plan to, to have something about that. Yeah, we've talked about maybe having some basic talks about you know different care settings um, and living arrangements for older adults to sort of all get on the same page. So. Yeah, the other part of that that's really um, useful and scary to know is the actual costs associated <laughs> with some of this stuff. Um, and, and who pays. And who pays, yeah, because <laughs> um, suddenly it makes, you know, like private colleges look pretty cheap. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so is there any one piece of advice you would offer to a family medicine resident to put them at ease in having the conversation with patients they've assessed and determined to be in the early stages of this disease. The discomfort level of 20-somethings with older patients is palpable. Hey, that, that is a, a really wonder, wonderful question. Um, and my, my um, general advice would be for this person to spend a little bit of time thinking about what their priorities are and what they consider the good with a capital G to be. Um, because ultimately, that's what you're, you're trying to pursue in your conversation with patients. So if this resident felt that their purpose in life was to save lives, like add, add, add on lifespan, that, that's their only goal. 
they're going to manage people's medical conditions as aggressively as possible to add years to their life, then that has a very different resonance than if someone is intending to improve people's quality of life or if they're in, intending to um, you know, prevent doing harm. So on, on this, this slide that we talked about before, there's a lot of different approaches. Um, and I know other people who work in dementia who have totally different approaches than I do. Uh, one of my former supervisors really had the, I have to tell people the bitter truth, no matter what it is. And she would come out and tell people, you know, at the early stages of, of the disease, you need to prepare. You've got a fatal condition. You're going to keep losing your ability to think and to do things. And it's going to, you know, be suffering for your family. And I would just sit there aghast, you know, like, what is she doing? Um, and what if she's wrong? And I tend to err much more on the side of, if I am wrong um, and I tell them they don't have dementia or I'm not sure, then they're going to go on their way and eventually they're going to figure it out and can deal with it. But if I'm wrong and I tell them they do have dementia, then they're going to lose a lot of sleep over it. So with the, the internal medicine resident, I, I think if um, he, he or she was able to, to stop and reflect on what it would be like to hear that from someone um, or if, if it was... Um, the, a, a family member who is getting that diagnosis, like what would you want the role of the healthcare provider to be, and, and hopefully in the process to um, understand more from an empathetic perspective what a diagnosis means. Uh, un unfortunately, the kind of uh, rigid hierarchy of medical education makes you think that once you know there's a diagnosis, you got to tell the person and you have to apply a pill for it. Um, which, which I think is very much not the uh, approach that would be helpful in the, the setting of dementia. Um, but I also wonder about, because there's much more coming out about um, early stage disease and, and in fact the Washington State Alzheimer's plan is encouraging people to share the diagnosis with the idea of being able to address another thing that you talked to us about, which is being able to make um, advanced care plans um, while the person still can share their wishes and desires in that regard. Absolutely, and that's, a, that's another very important part to, to add in. So as, as Barb pointed out, knowing in advance can be very beneficial or essential. And it's, it's really a question of how sure do you have to be? You know, like, I'm 20% sure somebody's got dementia, you probably don't want to tell. But if you're like 80% sure, and, and most of the advanced planning stuff, you know, like the stuff that Dr. Stewart discussed, you don't need to have dementia to do it. Like pretty much probably every, everybody should have been through some process of considering what their end of life wishes are and being able to ar articulate them. That's, that's a, a great question and uh, really touches on one of the, the core challenges that, that we deal with about the, the right way to deal with people. So um, ADS in Seattle asks, do you know of or are you familiar with mind ramps, Michael Patterson, Roger Anunson, and the six cogwheels of brain health? So I came across that um, recently, but I cannot remember much about it. it, it I don't know if you can t type this fast, but is it something you'd recommend people look into? Um, yeah, like the cogwheels of brain health. Maybe it was on PBS. I don't know. Roger Nunson's from Oregon. Oregon, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, we're uh, we're we're still learning a lot, um, and it, it's hard to know what what works and what what doesn't. Uh, and the, the the challenge I see is that the the risk factors for dementia. Okay, so you would recommend looking into it. So if folks wanted to check that out, that the uh, like the risk factors for dementia don't map all that well on who gets dementia. So. Yeah, a lot of patients who have terrible diabetes, terrible high, high blood pressure, uh, never get dementia. Whereas I have patients who um, you know, are running marathons in their 70s and never drank or smoked a day in their lives and have perfect cholesterol who get dementia. So it's, uh, it's not like you can necessarily do all that much as a guarantee that you won't get the disease. So the Matsu ADRC is asking about vagus nerve stimulation. Yeah, so this is a, a, a promising technique. Um, so basically, the, the vagus nerve is one that has a, a lot of um, 
inputs that go back up to the brain. And if you stimulate it, uh, then it seems to stimulate the, the whole brain. And it's been used as a treatment for uh, depression. In interestingly, it's uh, the same nerve that controls your vocal cords uh, in, in part. And so it's like talking a bunch has this, it'd be like, you know, if you could talk nonstop at a high volume, you know, 24 hours, that would be sort of the effect of vagus nerve stimulation. But there's some thought that um, stimulating it uh, might result in an increase in neurotrophic factors in the brain. It's certainly a long way off uh, from being uh, clinically applied. You know, the, the real challenge that we didn't get much into in this series was we don't know what causes dementia. Um, it's, it's sad uh, that despite, you know, 100 years of scientific research, we really don't know what the, uh, the main factors or uh, changes in the you know, early stages of the disease are. We know what it looks like after it happens, but in terms of the, the cellular or uh, neurological cascade that starts the process, we really haven't figured it out. So good, good, good question about vagus nerve, and maybe that'll turn into something. Questions Anything here? Else? Else? Any right. other questions out there? Great. Well, feel feel free to email me, um, and if you, especially if you have other ideas for the series next year, um, it'd be great to hear those because yes. we'll probably be organizing that um, in the next six months or so. Absolutely. What do you do when they get physical? Oh, all right. So I'm guessing this is about aggression, and um, so we didn't talk too much about the management of aggression in the lectures. Uh, Real, real quickly, uh, it's, aggression is a behavior. Getting physical is a behavior. And it's important to understand a behavior as a behavior. Uh, so you want to first analyze the behavior and think about why it's happening. So when you think about why, why people do things, uh, the, in de dementia, the first thing you got to make sure is that they're not delirious. So if uh, somebody is. Delirium is a, acute brain failure. That's the other name for uh, delirium. If they're they're having a, a process where they're they're sick and they're immediately confused, um, that's oftentimes when people get um, aggressive or assaultive, and you, you can fix it because it's a medical problem. So assuming it's not delirium, then the next step is to look into unmet needs. So if somebody uh, is thirsty, hungry, hot, cold has to go to the bathroom, they're lonely. It's just a natural human response when you have serious unmet needs to act out. Pain is a big one of those. So the people I know who work in nursing homes and deal with this all, all the time um, say that about half of the agitation or aggression really involves unmet needs and that you can usually pretty quickly address them if you start looking for them. Of course, it's a problem if someone is nonverbal um, they can't tell you that they're in pain, for instance. So in some studies out of England, they've used analgesic medications to, to treat pain in people with dementia, and the rates of agitation go down. So the other, so unmet needs are important. The other part of it is uh, conditioning. So if somebody um, does a behavior, even if they have dementia, if they get rewarded for it, they will continue doing that behavior. So unfortunately, in a lot of care settings, this is the best way to keep attention. So if you, uh, you know, hit somebody, you get somebody sitting there by your side, you'll likely keep hitting people. This even applies to classical con conditioning, like Pavlovian conditioning. There's a, a great case that our um, social worker told us about of a, a nursing home um, where, where she had worked, where they, they had a guy who would just slug people out of the blue, like no reason, totally calm guy. And then once in a while, he would just like punch people. And then, then you know, go about his business. And when they looked into his life story, he had been a boxer. And um, when he heard the bell ring at the elevator, oh, he so thought it was like the bell for starting the round. So he'd punch somebody. So when they moved him away from the elevator, everything got better. There's also a lecture posted. I don't know if you want to go back to the list of the ADR oh, yeah. lectures from Rebecca back. Logston from last year, I think it was, about um, I can't remember exactly, but it is um, a lecture on um, 
addressing sort of the behavior issues. Right. Is it, is, um, and um, so another thing that the they talk state? about in there is enhancing pleasant events. Exactly, yeah. Um, so it's a little bit further back. That's there. Uh, nope. Which, well. It's the first one. It's under there. What? Mm, it was like your first. There. Oh, that one. Okay, yeah, yeah right. So, um see if I can find it. Um, Challenging behaviors, the middle yes, and later. Yes, thank yeah, you. Yeah, it was, it was a middle and later. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so then um, another person says, could you do a seminar on the importance of calming the patient with dementia down so that they can at least begin to think rationally about whatever is bugging them? And another person said, read Dr. Power's book, Dementia Beyond Drugs. Yeah, so another two two great uh, suggestions about behavioral approaches. Um, really, the, the more we learn the, uh, about dementia and behavioral problems, the, uh, the less one would be inclined to use medications for dealing with it. Um, the, last, the last part of the agitation thing is if you can see the world from the perspective of the person with dementia, a lot of times you won't see their behavior as agitation. Instead, it's just protecting yourself. So if you're sitting here and someone tries to take your clothes off you, you're going to fight them and protect yourself. Um, but, but when somebody with dementia is doing that on the way to the bath, you call it agitation. So it's, it's important, and I think along the lines of the, the recommendations of calming the person down and of pleasant events to make sure that the individual feels safe in their world. Okay, other questions? All right, well, all right. well I can't you get all. away without telling Anchorage I'm coming up to visit my home in the summertime, and so I'll wave to you all from my dad's place in Jewel Lake Road and looking forward to seeing home again. Talk to you later.